Hi, my name is Katie Netter, a producer for Small Business Digest, and I am here with Andy Schachtel. So Andy, uh, as we ask all our guests on the show, uh, can you tell us about your personal background? Um, tell us about your company and your website. Sure. So um, I was, uh, I'm an American and I was born in New York City, uh, raised in Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Uh, and um, my, one, my professional life, I, I went to college in Connecticut and uh, after college, lived in Japan for a bit, uh, where I learned to speak Japanese. I lived in the countryside in a small town where nobody spoke English, so learned to speak Japanese. And then when I returned to the States, I went on uh, television, Japanese television. I was a reporter uh, from the United States, reporting for various kind of light news topics for morning shows in Japan, and segued that into... Um, TV commercial production for Japanese clients. So I'd made a company that would produce high-end commercials for uh, clients like Sony, uh, Shiseido, uh, for Japanese advertising agencies like Hakuhodo and Dentsu. And uh, so uh, if they needed to do a shoot or a campaign in the United States or somewhere in the world uh, that needed some uh, local coordination or production, then we would handle that for them. So that led me to my next uh, step in my career, which was to uh, license U.S. media properties for mobile phones. So in the early 2000s, uh, the first place in the world where mobile data services first took off was in Japan with Docomo, and they had the first ringtones and wallpapers. So I thought there might be an opportunity to license U.S. media properties for these Japanese mobile phones. Uh, but of course, U.S. media rights holders were a little bit hesitant to license their content for a technology that they didn't understand. So it took some time to negotiate those deals. Uh, and while Japan became a bit saturated with content, Europe was just opening up uh, their mobile data services with Vodafone and some of the other operators. So I was able to do a global deal with Vodafone to deliver content uh, like Condé Nast, Fox, HBO, and uh, others like that. Uh, one of the big hits for them was uh, actually Maxim Magazine, uh, which we licensed across the world for Vodafone. Uh, so we developed a little bit of expertise in delivering this kind of content to the mobile phone networks around the world, which each had different technical specifications, as well as at that time you had your flip phones and your brick phones. You had so many different varieties of phones. So based on that, Vodafone asked me to build a social networking platform for them to drive data traffic in those early days of mobile data services. So it would be the world's first uh, mobile-based uh, social network. Uh, and so it was a very large project and we were a small company. So I knew I needed to outsource. So I outsourced developers in India, first of all, but it didn't really get traction because our partners there weren't transparent with us. We had a lot of turnover on our team. Uh, we also had some issues with design sensibility. I happen to know some people in the Philippines. Uh, so we uh, hired developers directly there. We built a development team, uh, built and launched the application primarily with developers in the Philippines, launched it around the world for Vodafone. And then uh, it was one of the most successful mobile data services for Vodafone in those early days. Uh, and we then built a customer service team to support it and a content moderation team. And we ran that for a few years for Vodafone until everything changed on mobile with the rise of the open internet on mobile phones and smartphones. And then you had Friendster and MySpace and eventually Facebook. So Vodafone decided they didn't really want to be in the social networking business anymore. So I repurposed those teams to some other clients and that's how uh, this company SourceFit was born. And We've uh, grown in the same way that initial project did where clients come to us with a certain process they're interested in outsourcing. Maybe it's software development, maybe it's IT support, uh, customer service, and then over time they'll identify other processes. So that's why we as a company uh, service a lot of different industries, a lot of different verticals. And uh, we have about 1500 employees now. Uh, and we opened an office in the Dominican Republic last year, and we've just opened offices in South Africa and Armenia. So uh, we've always done a bit of software development just because that's our background. We built our own HRIS system <clears throat> to manage HR back in 2016. Uh, but now we're working on a much more ambitious project, which is a, uh, a comprehensive team engagement tool that covers 
not only HR, but also communications like chat, video chat, ticketing, um, project collaboration with Gantt charts and Kanban. Uh, it also covers uh, KPI building. So a lot of our clients have trouble um, with performance, say, of remote teams. And we found that one of the most effective strategies is to create a very clear uh, expectation or very clear KPIs uh, for the team. And so this tool will assist our clients and other companies to develop this uh, objective KPI uh, plan uh, to help monitor performance. And then uh, attached to that is gamification. Uh, so uh, for uh, clients to, uh, to further uh, incentivize their employees through games and then um, kind of rewards based on their performance. And it also has an aspect which is a database uh, management tool where people can build a, a big table to manage their niche processes. So the point of the whole thing is to allow small medium enterprises to put all of their data under one umbrella. What we've seen with our clients is they're using about four or five different software as service tools. All of their information is in different places. It doesn't work well with each other. If someone is championing one type of platform and then they leave, you know, the founder of the company is left like, you know, this whole aspect of my company is now unmanageable. So uh, what we're trying to do is to put all of those things into one place so that small and medium enterprises can get their data and work with it in the same way that uh, that large enterprises can. So uh, in addition to all of the other modules I mentioned, we also have an analytics and reporting tool. So you can, you can, um, take the information that's in your HR, in your project collaboration, in your recruiting, and then you can merge those into one complete picture. And so where does AI come into the picture? Um, well, we were thinking before that to build a machine learning model uh, across all of this kind of data would be really um, prohibitive in terms of the amount of time and labor it would cost uh, for us to add. So we were thinking originally that we would you make our analytics tool with you know hard coded uh, traditional types of formulations, but with the rise of la uh, large language models, uh, we now feel that uh, with the intrinsic knowledge of large language models and its ability to to understand natural language quite easily, we'll be able to uh, to really integrate AI into our tool. First of all, transforming its you know its its user interface completely, where before we were envisioning people navigating through the site to do various things. Now, uh, people will also be able to engage with uh, the application simply through typing in natural language. So it's kind of in three stages. First is informational and, and um, transactional, where um, someone can find out any information about the software by typing in any kind of request. So that's the first stage, like a supercharged chatbot. Uh, and then the second stage is operational. So what that means is that they can type in a command, uh, like let's say uh, they want to call up the salary of one of our employees, like an, uh, an HR or admin person. Instead of like going through a master list and searching around, they can just type in what is the salary of, of whoever it is. Or uh, for our HR IS system, instead of navigating to a calendar, selecting the leave date, clicking submit, having that go to the manager, having them go into the system, having them click approve. Now you can just say, I'd like to file a leave on May 24th. And then, you know, there it goes. So that's the second level, which is operational. The third level is analytical. So of course we can think of all of these different kinds of um, analysis that we can do for our clients. But uh, with the uh, large language models and their even newer capabilities now with uh, creating graphical representations from the models uh, with a new release from um, OpenAI uh, and even on open source models, uh, we'll be able to uh, have AI look at the data that we're, um, that we're putting into the system and then also suggest uh, different kinds of analysis suggest to us different graphical representations of the data. So it will even add uh, that kind of value to what we're doing. So, uh, so AI, uh, you know, has in the last four months transformed, you know, our approach to what we're building. And I think it will be really uh, incredibly helpful for, for us as a company, for our clients, and then eventually for, uh, for the market.
Uh, so that's that's kind of our vision for um, how we're using AI within our software sphere. But um, as a company, as an outsourcing company, of course, we're uh, incredibly exposed to the, the potential transformations of AI. You know, of course, outsourcing, you think of people doing kind of rudimentary tasks or simple tasks that could easily be replaced by AI. Uh, so um, companies like us, we either have to be on the forefront of AI or we could potentially be crushed, right? So I think a lot of business owners or um, you know people running businesses uh, have the same kind of thought, like how will we be affected you know, by, by AI? What do we need to do? Uh, to safeguard our business against the possible changes or, you know, to, to leverage it, you know, to, to, you know, improve our business and to supercharge our business. So like for all of our people doing all of these different processes, we have accountants, we have customer service, we have um, application developers. We have to look at each of these and we have to see how AI is affecting that particular task. And is there something that we can develop that will uh, help you know, our employees to do their task better. So if they're doing their task better, we feel like that's uh, protection for us against replacement. So we kind of think of it like, you know, we we, you know, we think of our employees, like let's say it's like Spider-Man in the Marvel comics, right? Um, and then he has his powers, like he has his abilities, but like if Iron Man can give him a special suit, you know, like a suit of AI, then, you know, that, increases his his capabilities and that's what we're trying to do with our um with, you know with with ai with our all of our tasks and i think it's a kind of a microcosm for what businesses around the world have to do you know with ai but uh go ahead i think you had a question um, sorry i was just speaking for a while there. no don't worry it, um that it was very interesting just to learn about how sourcefit is incorporating using ai so uh, why did, going off of that? Why did you decide to create SourceFit, and what did you see uh, missing in the business environment that inspired you to take this action? Yeah, so for me, um, the way that we work at SourceFit is kind of informed by my own experience when I was uh, creating a business. Um, you know, we had to build this large social networking platform. We didn't really have a big budget. You know, we were a small company. Uh, and I couldn't find people. Uh, we were based in Amsterdam at the time, uh, and uh, I could not find these developers uh, in Europe. So, uh, so it was a combination of those two factors that made me, on the client side, look to outsource. You know, it's like saving money and having access to talent. And then what I wanted from my outsource team is I wanted them to be part of the value of my company. I didn't want to just outsource like this development, someone builds it for me, I don't understand it at all. And then if something happens, I'm lost. I wanted these people to be really part of my team, but I just wanted someone else to manage them because they're in some other country. So that's the value proposition that we started to offer with, with SourceFit, which is like a completely transparent uh, extension of uh, companies' teams uh, that happens to be seated in um, the Philippines or South Africa or the Dominican Republic uh, or wherever it happens to be. Uh, but, you know, we'll man we'll recruit all the people, we'll manage them, we'll provide all of the IT, we'll provide a completely secure, um, you know, uh, security infrastructure for these people. So you don't have to worry about that. We'll provide training, we'll provide coaching, we'll provide everything that people need, uh, but they can have staff at a fraction of the cost uh, locally. And then they'll have access to talent that they wouldn't, necessarily have access to in the local markets, especially, you know, these days with uh, very tight labor markets around the world. So that's kind of the reason why um, I started Source. And it's really my joy to be able to work with a lot of entrepreneurs uh, and, you know, small companies who have great ideas or have have been, you know, working um, and been constrained by various things like short labor market or, or capital uh, to be able to expand uh, and grow and to, to enable them to do that through, through outsourcing. Mm -hmm. um, so you discussed um, your background in media and tech. Um, so how did you use those prior experiences to found your company? Uh, so certainly um, technology, having a background in technology uh, is critical when you're talking about uh, re remote teams um, like ours because uh, it's founded on technology. I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do what we, what we do without, of course, 
uh, high speed internet, without voice over IP, without these kind of basic technologies, which really transformed the world of business. So uh, being able to, to make use of that, and then of course, to be able to adapt to new technologies like AI that come along, um, you know, having, having, uh, ha being conversant in technology and having some idea of development of technology is really uh, helpful um, in any business these days. And especially with something like outsourcing where you're dealing with so many different kinds of businesses and so many different kinds of industries. And with regard to media, of course, marketing is important in any business. And uh, for us to be able to market around the world, having, an, uh, having some concept of, of uh, international marketing and what marketing uh, means, the different nuances and different uh, geographical areas has been really helpful, helpful for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so can you discuss some of the challenges that you faced um, while founding your business? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I like to say that um, when, when I'm running my business, when I'm talking with clients or when I'm talking with our employees, um, what I see in other companies a lot is people talking only about the positives, you know, We're going from strength to strength. Uh, but what I like to do and what feels more comfortable to me is to be honest about things and to talk about our struggles, to talk about, you know, the challenges that we've had. I mean, certainly uh, I'm proud of where we've arrived at as a company. Um, and I'm, you know, proud of some of the things we're able to do now that we have scale in terms of uh, impacting the lives of our employees, especially in places like the Philippines and South Africa, or impacting our community uh, around us, you know, with community outreach and environmental programs. Um, but, uh, you know, I think if I think about the number of days I've had this company, there are certainly more days with challenges than more days than days of triumph. You know, there were, uh, there were many months where we were, you know, touch and go, you know, like our largest client went out of business, you know, one, one year, right before Christmas, I had to lay off, you know, 50 people uh, right at Christmas time. I mean, so, you know, there's lots of, uh, of challenges that we've had to, to face, you know, over the years. And I think, you know, one of the common refrains of entrepreneurs uh, that I've heard speak is that you have to be resilient. And that's one of the, certainly one of the the key ingredients of um, running any company for any length of time is just to to keep looking ahead, keep taking incremental steps forward, and trying to get better as 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 much as you can uh, every day. And so that's the approach that that I've taken. And certainly, uh, you know, without the challenges, uh, we certainly wouldn't have learned as much as we have. Yeah. So going off of that, um, what advice do you offer to small business owners who are attempting to do the same? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, stay lean, you know, uh, stay lean and, uh, and be able to function without, uh, you know, huge infusion of capital if you can, uh, and uh, stay flexible, um, you know, be able to adjust to changing landscape and changing marketplace, uh, keep learning, um, keep trying new things, keep iterating, uh, don't be afraid to look at what you're doing and assess it try to obsess it uh, uh, assess it as objectively as you as you can uh, and then if you find uh, things that need improving just have the strength you know of will to to uh, keep improving things I think that that's that's um, my um, biggest piece of advice Mm -hmm. yeah so going off of that um you discussed AI um earlier so what is your advice to uh, businesses on how to adapt to emerging technologies such as AI and how may they use that this uh, technology to their advantage? Right. So uh, with AI, I mean, it's a bit unprecedented, the speed of, uh, of development. So uh, that's one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, you can, of course, learn from the past, learn you know, from uh, the evolution of the Internet, for example, the rise of social media. But this may be uh, orders of magnitude uh, different than that. Uh, so all you can do is learn as much as you possibly can. Um, of course, uh, I'll give a plug, plug for outsourcing companies like ours uh, with the, the ability to do a lot of research and, and hire people who are experts in AI for the sole purpose of helping our clients to navigate these technological changes. Uh, if you are able to 
to outsource any of your roles or um, you know a portion of your process uh, to a company with that expertise that can uh, help you to save costs and also help you to get get access to the latest technologies. Uh, so that's you know that's one strategy that I would recommend. I mean, it helped me. I would have never been able to do the social media project for Vodafone if I hadn't been able to outsource. And I think a lot of companies, if they are open to it, uh, can definitely benefit uh, from doing that. Mm -hmm. So how do you exp in, how do you envision um, AI reshaping the business environment? Um, and what do you expect to see in the future um, with this technology? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's going to have radical changes in terms of uh, you know, every industry, uh, things that were um, laborious manual processes will be able to be handled by AI. It'll be transformational. I just hope that uh, we can learn from the past in terms of some other technologies that have been disruptive. Uh, my big picture uh, for AI is, first of all, for business owners, yet yeah, you you have to you have to understand it and you have to be open to it. Um, and then I think if you are, you'll still have your niche because you know clients need to be served by people. You know they need, need to interact with, by people. If you can use AI to be a better provider of service yourself, uh, you'll win. Yeah. Uh, but with a big picture of AI, my own personal opinion about all of it is that um, I subscribe to the, the 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 school of thought that this is not our first. Uh, global interaction with AI that happened uh, with social media and the algorithms to attract uh, attention of users. And I feel like we lost that that interaction or we did not benefit because, you know, the general public was not party to any kind of negotiation about what they're giving up, you know, for their attention or, uh, you know, what what social media companies are getting. So, you know, the, the top companies uh, have unprecedented wealth and and power because of the AI algorithms that that they that they introduced to an unsuspecting general populace, right? So um, now going into AI, it's the same large companies who are doing the same thing, and it's being driven not by the public good, but by uh, the need to create shareholder value, right? So the public needs to have a seat at the table, and the only way to do that, no matter what people think about government, is through their elected representatives, which means that there needs to be regulation, which needs means that there needs to be kind of some kind of uh, comprehensive approach to digital um, platform regulation. I know that there's been some um, uh, uh, proposals in the Senate uh, for doing something like that, and I wholeheartedly uh, support uh, that, you know, even though I'm an entrepreneur and then, you know, I'm developing AI uh, systems myself, I still think that there needs to be a control so that uh, it can be for the greater good, because certainly there's a lot of potential for, for great things, but a lot of a lot of potential for harm as well. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting how, um, you know, companies and the government will react to the um, introduction of AI and the regulations that will need to come with it. Um, but what may our audience uh, find on your website? Uh, so um, our website's uh, www.sourcefit.com, S-O-U-R-C-E-F-I-T, sourcefit.com. And uh, so at our website, you'll find uh, a range of, of outsourced services um, to address virtually any kind of role in any industry. Uh, so if you're, if you've ever had a problem uh, filling roles uh, at at your company. Um, if you've had trouble, if you if you need to hire people but you don't have the budget, um, or if you need to hire people in a certain new area that you're just getting into but you don't really have expertise there and you don't know if you can really manage them uh, properly in that particular process. If let's say you're just starting a customer service team or you're starting a new soft, you want to develop a software product or uh, something along those lines. Uh, then you can find information about that at our website. And of course, we'd be happy to talk to any anyone who's uh, running a business and who's looking to grow, um, reduce their costs, uh, and enter new types of business activities. Mm -hmm. uh, so our last question to guests on the show is always, what would you like to leave um, our audience with? Um, I guess I'd like to, to leave the audience with... Um, a sense that uh, as a small business owners, or if you're running a small or medium 
enterprise, uh, there's a lot of tools at your disposal uh, to to help you to grow um, that don't necessarily cost an arm and a leg. Um, you can make use of uh, of AI tools uh, to help you. You can you can uh, take advantage of outsourcing uh, to to find staff um, and expertise. Uh, and so, uh, just try to explore uh, different different avenues as as best you can, and uh, keep on trying. And uh, you know, if there is some kind of downturn or some business challenge, uh, if you think um about enough different kind of avenues then you can find a way to overcome it thank you so much that's all the time we have andy but it was great talking with you and learning more about uh source fit um so thank you so much <laughs>